Good evening. We're glad to have you back with us again. Ken Chapman and I are continuing our study of the book of Ephesians. And tonight we want to look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. Ken, are you doing okay tonight? I am doing good. Looking forward to being with you again and, and all of our uh, viewers uh, in our study of the book of Ephesians. Well, why don't we just hop right into the text, and if you will, Ken, why don't you read verses uh, 15 and 16 of Ephesians 1. Okay, Ephesians 1, verses 15 and 16. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Well, he seems to like these folks a little bit. Uh, this is a little bit of a different uh, opening than you have maybe in Galatians, where in Galatians, he kind of jumps right on them. Uh, here, he expresses some thanks for them. Uh, there is some question about who this group is. Maybe Paul doesn't seem uh, as friendly with this group as you might expect him to be. Uh, some have attributed that maybe to this being a circular letter, but you do have his love for them is very obvious here as he is constantly praying for them. Ken, is there anything in these two verses we need to pick up before we get really kind of into the prayer itself? Well, not a whole lot. I, I just make the observation that we have to take Paul at his word that he was praying for them and then the only conclusion I can come to is that Paul's prayers must have been very lengthy. He yes. was praying for them, praying for the Thessalonians, praying for the Philippians. And again, I take Paul at his word, and so maybe that's a challenge for me. Am I praying enough for specifically for others instead of just generically, uh, or are my prayers too self-centered? So. That's a very good point of application there. Maybe our little short prayers are, are not, Paul would wonder, how, how are you done praying so quickly? So he is talking about praying for them, and now what he's going to do is basically tell them his prayer for them. And so in a second, I'm going to have you read this for us, Ken, and I, I think the best thing, if you just read this, it, it can almost be a little overwhelming how much he has to say, all these church words uh, that he uses here. Uh, he, he has gotten a little less lengthy. The first sentence of the letter was 202 words long. The second sentence is only 169. Uh, so he has cut back a little bit, but it's still a very long sentence. Our English versions have, have divided it up into various sentences for us, easier to understand. I'm just glad I don't have to sit down and uh, analyze this, you know, word by word. Oh, what's the thing we used to do in grammar class? Um, outlining sentences. Well, outlining, and then when you put the lines down below, diagram, there we go. Oh, okay. Think of my word. Yeah, I'd hate to have to diagram uh, these sentences. You'd need three whole sheets of paper <laughs> just to get that done. Can you mind reading this passage for us? Okay, again, Ephesians 1, this time verses 17 through 23. Paul continues, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet, gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who feels all in all. When you began to look at this, you see a very bold characteristic of Paul's writing, and that is that Paul likes to stack concepts and ideas. And then we just have to unpack it. 
Uh, and so he is stacking a lot here. And so the way I, I felt best to deal with this is just kind of divide this prayer into two sections. And I think in the first section, what he prays for is that they will be open and receptive and understanding. And then we're going to see the second half of the prayer is of what God has done for them. And so he, he strings along a number of phrases here he, that God may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. Now we're using the ESV for our base text. Ken, let me ask you, do you think that's supposed to be a capital S or should that be a lowercase s as in that, you know, just a spirit or the idea of wisdom and revelation? I would probably tend to make it a lowercase s of, of the spirit, their personal spirit or attitude of wisdom and revelation, but not a big deal. Right. That's kind of where I would go with it. Uh, it seems that everything else he's going to be talking about are, are a lot of things that they have control over knowing. Uh, and we're going to talk about knowledge here in just a minute. Doesn't seem to be some kind of special hidden, mysterious idea here. So I would tend to agree with you here. He's going to say, and I love this phrase, it's easy to get this picture in your mind, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. You know, we don't normally think about our hearts having eyes, uh, but the, the heart is the seat of emotions. It's the innermost being. Uh, it down in the pit of who you are and what you know and what you understand in everything. And I just, I love that phrase there. It's easy to get a picture of this in your mind. He says that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. And we use hope a little bit differently than the way the New Testament writers do. There's a connection, but a lot of times we say hope and we don't always have a lot of expectation with it. You might say, I hope to um, have a red Corvette in my house or in my driveway when I get home. Well, you, you might would like that, but there's not a great expectation of that. Uh, Paul's not using it like that. Paul latches on to the expectation part of this, that it's going to happen. And, and what you're going to do is focus on what's going to happen. And so hope is this future forward-looking excitement and belief in what God has promised. What, what do you think about this, this phrase here? Yes, I certainly agree with that. We use the word hope many times. It's synonymous with wish, uh, right. but this is certainly the, the hope, the confidence uh, the Hebrew writer speaks of, the confidence of our hope uh, that he has called us to, that we might know and understand. And I take this whole idea of the understanding or knowledge in here to be more of the understanding in, in the sense of appreciating. Not that he's saying, I hope you completely understand the details of all of this. We might illustrate it, a, a father may be speaking to his ungrateful children and saying, do you know what all your mother has sacrificed for you? That's a good example. He doesn't mean, can you list them and, and, and put you know, financial figures beside all of them, but is he saying, do you understand, do you appreciate them? And so I think that's the idea here, not that he's saying, I want you to completely understand all of these great spiritual depths, but I want you to appreciate what God has done for you. Exactly. Wonderful, wonderful thought there. He is going to continue about what he hopes they know, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, that, that's one of those phrases. That's not a long sentence, but boy, it's loaded. Uh, it's kind of chunky as he adds idea to idea to idea. And we've already dealt a little bit with the riches of this inheritance uh, that we're thinking about here. And then he comes down, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power? Uh, so if you get in the car and you look down at the dash, you'll see where your miles per hour are. You'll see your speedometer. And then you'll see your RPMs. And, and we have this register here of, of the power uh, that, that's coming out of our engine. And uh, when we think about God, and I realize this is a silly example, but when it comes to God acting, there's nothing to measure it with. Uh, there, you know, when Jesus healed the woman who reached out and touched the hem of his garment, it says that he felt power going out of him. 
uh, but it's not like he lost any power. Uh, th th this power of God is just immeasurable. We can't even fathom it. And I think this is where he's going to begin to turn in this prayer. We begin with this openness, this reception, this understanding that he wants for them. And now we begin to think about what he wants them to understand and appreciate. And he's going to use uh, in the next couple sentences an illustration of that great power. What's the greatest demonstration? And sometimes maybe as Christians, we take this for granted, our acceptance of this event, but it is the greatest demonstration, uh, visible at least, of the immeasurable greatness of his power. Absolutely. Absolutely. Before we get into the second half of this prayer, I thought I would just kind of emphasize the theme, the very common theme throughout this letter of Ephesians uh, uh, on the idea of knowledge. And uh, I, I agree with what you were saying. It's not always just this academic, can you list out these things, but do we appreciate uh, what's going on? There, there, there is some head knowledge that has to be had, uh, but then it has to go into our heart. Uh, it's not just about understanding a list. And so you can see the verses here where this just comes into play over and over and over uh, in this epistle. So pa Paul is not using maybe the, the Gnostic idea of knowledge, this special secret hidden knowledge. No, in fact, this is what's being made known to everyone. And by reading Paul, we too can understand uh, the will of God that, that's been given to us. So we need to know those things and allow that to seep in to our heart. Let's look at the second half of this prayer, and I've kind of uh, emboldened here what, what I feel is the emphasis in the second half of the prayer, and that is the immeasurable greatness of God's power. So he wants them to be open and receptive and understanding of what God has done and what his power has accomplished. And so we see, as you just made mention to, his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And Ken, I say this a lot in, in sermons, that we have become callous to resurrection because we read these biblical stories all the time. And yet at the end of the day, I think it's what, seven or eight times in scripture in a 4,000 or so odd year span, uh, eight people were raised from the dead. This just doesn't happen. And we read it like, oh yeah, not a big deal. Uh, and it happens rarely. And this is kind of the ultimate one here. We see God's power as he raises someone from the dead. We're not talking about resuscitation. We're not talking about anything like that. We're talking about resurrection. Yeah, you're right. Maybe it's a testament to our faith and acceptance uh, of, of the biblical facts that are stated. Uh, but let's never uh, fail to be in awe of the fact. Imagine today if someone like a Lazarus or a Jesus who had been dead for days, uh, verifiably dead for days, had been now raised from the grave, raised from the tomb. Uh, imagine our shock and our awe uh, of that because we understand that really from a human standpoint, that's impossible. Right. That power does not reside within us. Right. Uh, and of course it resides within God. And so the awe that, Yes, we accept that fact. We don't even question that fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but don't let our uh, acceptance of it diminish our awe and wonder at the fact of God's immeasurable power. Absolutely. He's going to continue in discussing what God has done by seating him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Ken, you and I have talked about this off air before, uh, that maybe the ascension doesn't get enough discussion. Uh, in, in, in the in biblical theology, if you will. Uh, it's a very important scene, a uh, very important unfolding of God's plan there and who Christ is and what this represents. Well, this goes into what God has done and into his power. And he says that this is far, that where God has seated Jesus, where it, Jesus now is, is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named. Now we could look into the Greek words here, and I'm sure there's some, some differences between these words, but Paul likes to do this sometimes. He uses words that have a little bit of different meaning, but they kind of overlap. 
And, and the reason he does that, it seems, is to make sure every aspect of this is discussed. And so if we have some overlap here, oh, wait a minute, you didn't mention this, you know, area that Christ is not above. This way, everything is overlapped, everything is taken care of, everything is discussed here, even above those who might be named. Yes, the, the, the word all with rule, authority, power, and dominion, those overlapping words should lead us to the conclusion there is nothing right. that is outside of his power and rule. Right. Uh, you know, the, the overlapping of those words, the inclusion of the word all, just everything. There's nothing that he is not ruling over. Exactly, exactly. And then he not only kind of gives us this spatial idea that he's above all of these things, but now he gives us the, the temporal aspect of it, not only in this age, but also in the one to come, which is kind of an interesting thing to think about a temporal aspect to eternity. Uh, you know, he's again using human language to try and explain these things for us. And then he says, and he put all things under his feet. I think there has to be an echo of Psalm 110 here. Uh, and, and everything has been subjected to him and gave him as head over all things to the church. And so we see Paul just, again, stacking concepts here to talk about what God's power has accomplished. And I know you've all heard sermons and Bible classes uh, on, on these things. So one thing that really catches me, let's, let's go back to this phrase right here, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion above every name, that is named. We have discussed the existence of God alone so much, and we have emphasized that aspect so much, coupled with the worldly insistence on naturalism. When you put those two things together, we don't often think about what's going on behind the curtain of our world and universe. Maybe that's one thing that makes a book like Revelation so difficult. But then we come to a phrase like this in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2, Ephesians 3, Ephesians 4, and Ephesians 6. This is all mentioned again. There is something going on behind the curtain in the spiritual realm, and you have rulers all of these various dominions. Maybe think back to the book of Daniel, where it seems that these angels are given uh, dominion over various nations and some things that we don't often think about. So Ken, as we, as we think about this, how, what, what impact is, is this phrase supposed to make on me when I am not normally concerned about demons and angels and, and these other kinds of powers? Well, we certainly have a limitation to our knowledge and our understanding of that world, uh, but maybe the concept here is, again, this all rule authority that there is nothing beyond his dominion. That which we understand and can see and comprehend and that which we cannot, even the, not just the physical realm and the spiritual realm. And so maybe that phrase that follows when he says not only in this age, but also the age that is to come, may not just be saying now and then, but may be saying here and there. Mm -hmm. Speaking not just of two time frames, but of two realms of existence right, of the right. physical and the spiritual. Uh, and I think, again, it just speaks of his all-encompassing power, that which we can see and understand, and that which we cannot see and cannot understand. So, so you would maybe argue that it's not that we need to see so much what's going on behind the curtain and, and understand all that. What we need to understand is that there's everything and Jesus Christ is above it all. Yes. So, yeah. so whether it's angels or demons or, or whatever it is, it doesn't matter because Christ is above it all. I, I, I like that point. And it saves us from having to try and figure out what all these angels and demons <laughs> are doing. Well, let's go to this last phrase. This is a well-known passage, verses 17 or 15 through 23. And when we talk about this phrase or, or this passage, when we preach on it, when we teach on it, when we write about it, again, we always go to this verse right here. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, 
the fullness of him who fills all in all. Ken, let me ask you this. You're, you're the older, wiser preacher here. Why is this our hook? Why is this where we go and hammer this passage home? And, you know, what, what is this passage saying? For someone who hasn't heard this passage all their life, what's it saying and why is it so important? Well, first of all, I'll own up to the older part. I don't know about the wiser, but uh, maybe for a couple reasons. Is one is, is this is something that we can relate to. I can't understand, though, that all authority, power, and dominion, this age, that age to come, but I can understand the church, and I can understand Christ being the head of the church, yeah. uh, and so it's certainly relatable to me, but I also think that these last uh, two verses are the culmination of his argument, uh, that what's being talked about, that here is Christ in this immeasurable greatness of the power of God. Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He has all rule, authority, dominion, and power over the entire universe. And, and, and not even the universe, because we usually limit that to the physical, but to the spiritual universe as well. And that one who has that dominion and power has been given to be the head over the church. And so think about the enormity of that power, and that power has been used in regard to the church. And so this really immeasurable universal power is now being used in this limited sense, we might say. Uh, and all of that power is channeled now into his body, the church. So the one who's the ruler of the universe is also the head of this church. Uh, and so it speaks of, of that power that's being used here. And then he talks about uh, this last phrase, which is, speaking of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That last phrase, as beautiful as it is, is a bit confusing. What does that mean? That, that's my question. That I've always been a little thrown off. I, I feel like I'm supposed to really appreciate that phrase. Uh, you know, I've heard the preachers pound the pulpit on this phrase. But what does he mean when he talks? It's very repetitive, the fullness of him who fills all all in all. Can, can I read you what the message, how the message translates this? And I realize that's, that's not a, a version we normally use, uh, but I thought this was interesting. It says, the church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts, by which he fills everything with his presence. And I think he's kind of leaning towards the role and the work maybe of the church in the world, is that kind of what he's getting at? I, that seems to be what Peterson's getting at in the message. Is that what Paul is saying? I believe so. There's two ways to interpret this, this fullness, the church being the fullness, is in a passive sense or in an active sense. Uh, it could be saying that the church fulfills Christ. Uh, in the sense that we're the body. What good is a head without a body? And the church was the purpose. Jesus didn't die and was raised from the dead just to accomplish it. He did that so that the church might be given life and given a mission. And so there's that possibility that the church is the fullness of Christ. But we can also take this maybe in the passive sense that the church is not that which fills, but it's the vessel that's being filled. Mm. Uh, and that's the way I would see this, is that, the, that we are the fullness. He completes us rather than the other way around. Uh, and that seems to be the way that, that, that the New Testament uses that type of concept uh, more and more, uh, is that here is the church, and here is the ruler of the universe, is now completing us and filling this body. And so everything really begins with the head. It is the head that gives power and life to the body, not the other way around. Uh, and not just life, but the immeasurable greatness of his power is what fills the body, his church, and gives it life and gives it meaning. Uh, and is the true essence of what the church is. That's the way I, I see this beautiful and powerful uh, concept of, of, of again, the, the magnificent ruler of the universe is channeling that power into his body. 
So when we finish this chapter, you have a grand, if not uh, very wordy, but a grand telling of the gospel in, in chapter one. And, and it, it's wrapped in very theological language. This, this is probably about as short a theology that could be written about the gospel. Uh, and just phrase stacked upon phrase, and you got to dig in to appreciate it even more. And, and we've only spent a, a very short amount of time doing that in, in this is our third video. But when you dig in and begin looking at these phrases and seeing what God has done for us in Christ, we should be overwhelmed. And Ken, I love this picture that you're creating for us. The ruler of all the universe, the ruler of everything, is also the head of the church, and we can funnel it down even more than that, is look at what he's done for me, Jonathan Caldwell. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, this chapter is almost overwhelming when you get through kind of a, a, um, a shallow reading of it, when you drill down into what's being said, it's a little overwhelming. And when we think of the intent of Paul's prayer, that this spirit of wisdom and understanding might be ours, uh, as we look at the beauty and the intricacy of these words, as we lean in with a magnifying glass to look at the brush strokes at the work of art, let's not forget to back up and just appreciate right. the work of art in its entirety. And so don't get lost in the words and right. the meaning of every individual word that you can do that. And there's benefit in that, but there's also benefit in just standing back and just marveling in the power of God that's being used on our behalf. I can't help but think of a silly example. The, the book that Walter Isaacson has written on Leonardo da Vinci spends a long time talking about da Vinci's uh, ability and, and some of the specific things he would do, specifically uh, Leonardo uh, da Vinci's cross hatching. Uh, and and I, don't, I don't understand all that. But what I do understand is that when you back up from those portraits and when you back up from those pictures, whatever's going on in there, you appreciate the work of art. And so there's some of this that can be a little overwhelming, but then when you back up, as you said, you can appreciate this. Well, thank you for tuning in. We hope you have benefited from our discussion today. I know I have, and I, I'm actually looking even more forward to digging into some of this. And then we will think next week about Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 10 as Ken leads that discussion for us next time. We'll see you soon.